这是一条让我能触摸祖先的路。या ठिकाणी नोकरी धंदा व व्यवसाय या संधी बारा महिने उपलब्ध असतात In 1975, an old shipwreck was discovered off the southwest coast of the Korean Peninsula. On board were 20,000 pieces of porcelain and 2,000 metal objects. But of far greater interest to archaeologists was a huge collection of ancient coins, 8 million of them in all, weighing 28 tons. Ancient coins had spent over 600 years underwater. Originally from China, they are now the prize exhibit at the National Research Institute of Maritime Cultural Heritage in Makpo City, South Korea. It's June 1323. A merchant ship sets sail from Ningbo in China. But before it can round the foot of the Korean peninsula, it runs into difficulties and sinks. Wooden slips found on board the ship reveal that it was bound for Japan. The huge quantity of old copper coins testified to the prosperity of maritime trade in East Asia at the time. From the 14th century, when the vessel sank, to the 16th century, copper coins were in widespread use in China and the surrounding regions. They were the basis of an international system of commerce. Evidence has been found of the exchange of currency and cross-border trade among the countries and regions along the land and maritime Silk Roads. The Tang West Market Museum in Xi'an, China, houses a collection of gold and silver coins. They are all over a thousand years old and originated in the Byzantine and Sassanid empires. 
These coins and others like them would have been used for settling trade deals along the ancient Silk Road, reaching China from the Mediterranean Sea, the Arabian Peninsula, and Persian Plateau. They would have passed through the hands of numerous merchants in West and Central Asia as they traveled across prairies and deserts, mountains and rivers. Since ancient times, currencies have accompanied the flow of commodities, playing a vital role in supporting trade and commerce. Sost is a small town in Pakistan near the border with China. The few rows of houses belie the place's importance. In fact, this is the first stop on the Karakoram Highway after it enters Pakistan. A shipment of clothing, footwear, and hats has been loaded ready to be sent to Peshawar in northwest Pakistan. Another shipment consists of hardware and small electric appliances also made in China. Import from China and uh, going to Islamabad. Oh. It's used for uh, in Pakistan for tea. Yes. Uh, there are different types of goods. These all that come from China. Fry pans, fry fish, and uh, uh, like everything. A shipment of Pakistani fried pine nuts is passing through customs. It's about to embark on a long journey all the way to Jiangsu in southeast China. The increased frequency of the trade between China and Pakistan has led to the appearance of a new logo in this small town, China Union Pays. Using a China Union Pay card, it's possible to withdraw Pakistani rupees from the ATMs here. With more and more Chinese goods featuring in the lives of ordinary Pakistanis, the trade is being supported by more convenient means of monetary settlement. Karachi, the commercial and financial center of Pakistan, is a vast city with a population of 20 million. Each year, Chinese goods valued at several hundred million U.S. dollars arrive here. Payment can be made with a China Union Pay card everywhere from large department stores to roadside shops. As cross-border trade grows in volume, so the need arises for more convenient and efficient means of settlement. This improved financial connectivity will, in turn, boost the further development of trade. With China's profile in international trade rising and the Chinese and global economies becoming steadily more integrated, so the Chinese Yuan, or renminbi, has begun to play a major role in international finance. According to a report by the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunication, over the past three years, the proportion of UN payments in trade among Asian countries has risen from less than 10% to over 
The rise of the UN in Asia-Pacific trading has persuaded many companies from developed countries that they need to increase their use of the Chinese currency in their overseas dealings. Among them, 86% of UK exporters report using the UN, while the figures for Vietnam and France are 70% and 63%. In the past 20 years, the contribution of Asia, Africa, and Latin America to global trade has been steadily increasing. The most prominent growth is seen in Asia, led by China. In 1993, commodities from China accounted for just 2.5% of the global export market. By 2010, the figure had reached 10.6%. Changes in trade patterns inevitably affect the use of currencies in international settlement. Generally, a country's degree of integration into international and regional trade will determine the acceptance of its currency worldwide. Of the top 10 most traded currencies on the global foreign exchange market, eight are issued by developed countries. Just two belong to developing countries. They are the Chinese Yuan and the Mexican Peso. The U.S. dollar remains the most important global currency, playing the leading role in international settlements and transactions. The dollar is estimated to be used in around 44% of global foreign exchange transactions. 60% of foreign exchange reserves worldwide are held in U.S. dollars. More than half of cross-border loans and deposits are also in the American currency. In July 1944, with World War II drawing to a close, delegates from more than 40 countries gathered here in New Hampshire in the United States. The meeting decided on a global monetary system to be introduced after the war. The U.S. dollar was granted the dominant role in what is known as the Bretton Woods system. Its value was pegged in gold, while the exchange rates of other currencies were pegged to the U.S. dollar. The strength of its currency afforded the United States a privileged position in international trade and a disproportionate influence in a wide range of international affairs. However, by the end of the 1960s, with countries increasingly defaulting on their international payments and domestic inflation rising sharply due to the Vietnam War, the United States decided to end the Bretton Woods system. In August 1971, the Nixon administration announced the suspension of the convertibility of dollars into gold. No longer pegged to the price of gold, the value of the dollar was allowed to float. The collapse of the Bretton Woods system left the world facing severe financial volatility. Welcome back. That statement certainly true in the case of Lehman Brothers, shares of which have been down as much as 18%. In September 2008, the collapse of investment bank Lehman Brothers sparked a subprime mortgage crisis in the U.S. before long. The Eurozone was also affected. Faced with the unprecedented volatility in the international financial system, banks cut their lending. As a result, global trade plunged by a quarter. The world economy was confronted with its most serious recession since the Great Depression of 1929. There's been a frustration among emerging markets for a long time by the lack of progress with governance reform within the Bretton Woods institutions. So I uh, think uh, we will see uh, China becoming a major stakeholder in the global economy. So it makes sense that we see a new set of institutions emerging 70 years after the creation of Bretton Woods. Research by the International Monetary Fund at the time concluded that the Chinese UN was most likely to withstand the crisis and become the international currency of choice.
In 2015, the yuan was the fifth most used currency in international settlements and the sixth most traded. If not becoming a, a reserve currency, at least I expect that more and more uh, trading will be invoiced in renminbi and settled also in renminbi. So as this happens, if the share of uh, trade settled, uh, invoiced and settled in renminbi increases, there will be also need for financing uh, in renminbi and so on. That's a process which is uh, automatic. Today, the UN is going through a period of significant development. It's circulating more widely on foreign markets and becoming a globally recognized currency in pricing, settlement, and reserve holdings. In October 2015, the People's Bank of China launched the UN cross-border payment system. The move was a milestone in the internationalization of the Chinese currency. Uh, the IMF's executive board decided that the renminbi qualified for the SDR basket. On November 30th, 2015, the IMF declared that the renminbi, the Chinese yuan, was to be included in the SDR basket, effective from October 1st, 2016. The SDR, or Special Drawing Rights, are a foreign currency reserve maintained by the IMF. As a kind of ledger asset, they can be used to repay debts to the IMF and to cover balance of payment deficits between members. The inclusion of the UN means its value will be calculated based on the market exchange rates of the five currencies in the SDR basket. Apart from the UN itself, these are the US dollar, the euro, the Japanese yen, and the British pound. The development of the Belt and Road Initiative will facilitate financial connectivity in global trade and investment. This in turn will help to adjust and optimize the international financial system. Today, the province of Yunnan lies in southwest China. Its proximity to Southeast Asia means trade with the region has always prospered and gave rise to the southwestern route of the Silk Road. Early on, the cross-border use of currencies facilitated business transactions here. The paper money is called a Tian banknote. It was issued by Yunnan province during the Republic of China period in the early 20th century. Back then, Tian banknotes were in widespread use along the Yunnan-Vietnam Railway. Circulating in Myanmar, Laos, and Vietnam, they effectively became a regional currency. On the banknote is inscribed the name of the bank that issued it, the Phu Tien Bank. The Phu Tien Bank began issuing the Tian banknotes immediately after its founding in 1912. In December 2007, the name of this famous bank was revived, where the Kunming Commercial Bank was reformed as the Phu Dien Bank Company. Along Yunnan's 4,000-kilometer-long international border, there are some 20 official crossing points. Fudian Bank has established branches in all these border towns. In this way, it has established itself as the leading cross-border UN settlement bank in the region. 
It sets realistic exchange rates for the yuan against the currencies of the neighboring countries, including the Lao Kip and Thai Baht. This eliminates the cost and risk involved in using the U.S. dollar as an intermediate currency. The main这些我们都设置了分级机构这种分支机构它本身所在的区域就是国家已经批准的跨境金融合作区那么跨境金融合作区的机构的金融机构的设立互联银行的设立加上境外的老中银行的这种互动就能够让我们的边境贸易的规模
The yuan is the third largest among Hong Kong's currency holdings after the Hong Kong and U.S. dollars. Several global financial centers are now vying to become offshore yuan markets. After Hong Kong, Singapore is the second largest offshore center of trade in the yuan. In 2015, over 6 trillion yuan was cleared through here. In addition to those in the Asia-Pacific region, yuan clearing banks are also found in London, Frankfurt, Paris, and Luxembourg. The yuan offshore business has reached the western end of the Silk Road and entered the major countries of Europe. On October 14, 2014, the UK government issued sovereign bonds in the yuan, valued at 3 billion yuan. The proceeds from the sale would be used as foreign exchange reserves. It was the largest volume of sovereign bonds denominated in yuan to be issued by any government other than China's. Once again, it demonstrated the yuan's potential as an international reserve currency. Yuan it's forecast that in the next five years, China will import goods worth more than 10 trillion U.S. dollars. Its outbound direct investment is expected to top 500 billion U.S. dollars and outbound visitors 500 million. In other words, China will see annual imports of goods worth 2 trillion U.S. dollars, annual direct outbound investment of 100 billion U.S. dollars, and 100 million annual outbound visitors. The thriving Chinese economy will have a positive effect on the recovery and development of the global economy to the benefit of the whole world. As part of the Belt and Road Initiative, China has begun to offer extensive financial services around the world. Chaoshan Port in Ningbo is the world's fourth largest container port based on its comprehensive e-commerce service platform, which combines trade and finance, the Ningbo Shipping Exchange has released the Marine Silk Road Index. The Marine Silk Road Index is a composite index reflecting the performance of the shipping and trade markets inside and outside China. It was first released in October 2015 through the Baltic Exchange, the first time this 270-year-old institution had released an index produced by another exchange. We These are semiconductor chips, making up what is popularly known as a wafer. A single wafer comprises more than 3,000 chips, each smaller than a fingernail and containing millions of transistors and complex circuits. They are the core components of electronic products, such as mobile phones and computers. This packaging facility belongs to Stats Chip Pack Limited in Singapore. In the course of testing and screening, the substandard chips will be discarded. The chips that pass inspection will be picked one by one from the wafer and packaged before leaving the factory. The process is known as testing and packing. It is an intermediary step during the manufacturing process of electronic products and involves numerous cutting-edge technologies. It's a field where Stats Chip Pack ranks fourth globally in terms of market share. In January 2015, 
50.98% of its shares were purchased by Chinese company JSAT. This cross-border acquisition caused a considerable stir in the global electronics industry. As China's largest semiconductor packaging and testing service supplier, JSET ranks sixth in the world. However, it still lags behind the leading companies in the industry in its research and development. To upgrade its technology, JSET set its sights on STATS chip pack. However, the reality was, in 2013, JSET's revenue from packaging and testing services was 146 million U.S. dollars. By comparison, Stats Chipback's revenue was 749 million dollars, more than five times greater. The two companies were poles apart in terms of both revenue and assets. JSET realized it could not complete the acquisition on its own. Mergers and acquisitions are commercial activities motivated by a desire for development. Worldwide, Chinese companies are becoming increasingly active in M&A activity. Statistics show that by the end of June 2014, there had been a total of 5,270 overseas acquisitions conducted by Chinese companies, with a combined value of 33.7 billion U.S. dollars. This placed China second in the world after the United States. Financial institutions have played an important role in the cross-border acquisitions by Chinese companies. Industry insiders have described JSET's acquisition of Stats Chip Pack as a snake swallowing an elephant. The deal was supported by the Bank of China through its offices in Singapore and Macau. The acquisition has benefited both JSET and Stats Chipak. By pairing the Chinese market with world-class technology, the deal will give the merged company a sound and advantageous position in the industry. This is a very good example of close collaboration and mutual beneficial of ties between China and Singapore. Uh, there's a saying that goes itai ilu on this one. As a result of the combination of Jason Satchipak, we'll be able to jointly develop new market, whether it's uh, more competitive emerging uh, market such as India and Vietnam, a more mature market, uh, U.S. and Europe, and also for China market itself by bringing additional customer that wants to expand into China. The adoption of the Belt and Road Initiative has launched increasing numbers of Chinese companies onto the global stage. As companies expand, so does their demand for financial services. China's big state-owned banks have established branches in countries and regions along the Belt and Road to provide financing for the country's overseas businesses. <laughs> In Brunei, cars are as common as electric appliances.
Brunei is rich in oil and gas reserves. It's the second largest oil producer in Southeast Asia. Oil and gas output accounts for half of the country's GDP. The pipelines that crisscross the country are Brunei's economic lifelines. Yet they are all imported. Every year, Brunei requires 200,000 tons of pipes. This is a market that the world's steel pipe makers have found hard to ignore. Huludao City Steel Pipe Industrial Company is China's leading manufacturer of straight seam welded pipes. The company saw a rare opportunity in establishing a factory in Brunei. However, financing was a big challenge. To serve the project's needs, local banks in Liaoning produced a tailor-made financing plan and provided a loan of 21.23 million U.S. dollars. The Huludao Pipe Factory is now under construction. With the capacity to produce 100,000 tons of oil pipes, it will go into operation by the end of the year. It will be the only producer of straight seam welded pipes in Brunei. Annual output value is estimated at 100 million US dollars, and it will create more than 300 jobs in a country with a population of 400,000. Developing countries desperately need investment in capital, especially for infrastructure construction. For many years, investment and financing support for infrastructure construction has been provided by a handful of major international financial institutions. These include the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. However, they have not always been able to meet the special demands for capital of the developing countries. Data indicates that Asia's need for infrastructure investment each year is at least 800 billion US dollars. 68% of it is investment in new infrastructure and 32% in maintaining the existing infrastructure. The Asian Development Bank estimates that between 2010 and 2020, the Asia Pacific region may need 8 trillion US dollars for developing its infrastructure. The World Bank is able to provide loans of up to 60 billion US dollars. The Asian Development Bank is also restricted in what it can offer. Uh, I think the truth is this. Number one, Asia has a huge infrastructure deficit. That is, uh, there's not enough infrastructure, economic mm -hmm. infrastructure across Southeast Asia, South Asia, Central Asia, West Asia. Number two, current global public capital is inadequate from the World Bank, from the regional development banks. In such a reality, the developing countries and emerging economies must find a new solution. Fortaleza is a major port in northeastern Brazil. This beautiful coastal city was the birthplace of a landmark agreement, the Fortaleza Declaration. On July 15, 2014, the leaders of the BRICS countries declared the establishment of the BRICS New Development Bank. The bank would provide financial support for infrastructure construction in emerging economies and developing countries. A reserve for the New Development Bank was created, amounting to 100 billion US dollars. 41 billion US dollars of it was committed by China, 18 billion each by Russia, Brazil, and India, and 5 billion by South Africa. This major new multilateral lending institution is a practical attempt to remedy the defects in the global structure of financial governance. One route, one road is that 
the idea of supporting a greater China infrastructure projects which will help uh, nearby countries, whether it's Kazakhstan or other countries, India, uh, Pakistan, those infrastructure projects that allow for more exports from China to the world, more imports from the world to China. In today's world, China is a crucial player on the financial and capital markets. In 2014, China's outbound FDI for the first time topped 100 billion US dollars drawing roughly equal with inbound investment. China's aggregate outbound investment amounting to more than 660 billion US dollars has ranked as the world's third highest for two consecutive years. This is not only evidence of the profound change in China's position and role in the global economy, but also a result of China's willingness to marry its own development with that of other countries. Uh, China has always been a recipient of invest foreign invest investment, and, and in fact foreign direct investment has been for a long time part of the, an important part of China's uh, development model. Uh, but now China is going to be one of the key investors in the world. But it will start, as I understand it, in, in the region, in the surrounding areas. And I think it is a very clever, smart idea because uh, we know that countries benefit from the prosperity of their neighbors. In promoting connectivity among Asian countries, China is making use of its financial strength to provide direct support. The dialogue on strengthening connectivity partnership convened in Beijing on November 8, 2014. In a keynote speech, President Xi Jinping announced that China would commit 40 billion US dollars to establishing a Silk Road Fund designed to finance connectivity programs. These would include infrastructure construction, resource development, and industrial and financial cooperation in countries along the Belt and Road. The Jhelum River runs across the north of Pakistan. It was the focus of the first investment made by the Silk Road Fund, the Carrot Hydropower Project, to be built where the river describes a wide bend. The Carrot Plant, with planned investment of 1.65 billion US dollars, will be the fifth largest hydropower station in Pakistan. It will benefit Pakistan not only by easing the pervasive electricity shortages, but also by creating more than 2,000 jobs. The Carrot Hydropower Project was considered a worthwhile investment by the Silk Road Fund, based on an assessment of its potential social benefits and economic performance. The investment is in the form of a mixture of equities and loans. The Silk Road Fund joined a banking consortium led by the Export-Import Bank of China to provide financing for the project. When we were providing investment, we were using many different financial resources to combine the power of the Silk Road Fund. We were also working with the International Bank of China, and we also contributed to the financial support of the Silk Road Fund, and we also contributed to the financial support of the Silk Road Fund. For medium and long-term projects promising stable and reasonable returns, the Silk Road Fund provides financing options in diverse forms, combining equities and loans. As the first investment by the Silk Road Fund, the Carrot Hydropower Project has already demonstrated the advantages of the fund's medium and long-term development strategy. When we choose the project, we should consider if the project is consistent with the development strategy. 就像我们对于巴基斯坦，巴基斯坦电力极度缺乏，所以我们支持他们做水电项目。那么实际上就是帮助他们解决这个电力不足的问题。除此以外呢，我们还要考虑，呃，怎么样解决这个经济效益和社会效益的平衡问题。我们因为是一个按公司法注册的公司，我们要按照市场化、国际化和专业化的原则来运行。我们不是一个财政性的或者说捐助性的基基金。We need to solve our investment. 
However, with so many large-scale infrastructure projects requiring funding, additional finance leverage is required. In view of the enormous demand for investment in infrastructure in Asia, a major strategic plan was put forward. In October 2013, during a visit to India, President Xi Jinping proposed a new initiative, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. The AIIB, as an intergovernmental financial development institution, would make it a priority to support infrastructure construction aimed at improving regional connectivity and economic integration in Asia. And World Bank or Asian Development Bank, uh, they are doing their job and they are expanding uh, the investment project, I guess. But that's not enough. To supply enough uh, infrastructure investment, uh, I think Chinese initiative uh, is a very good one. The proposal for the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank received a positive response. In October 2014, 22 prospective founding members signed the Memorandum of Understanding on establishing the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. They included China, India, Kazakhstan, Malaysia, Mongolia, and Vietnam. As interest in the AIIB grew, on March 12, 2015, the UK officially submitted its application for membership becoming the first major Western country to do so. The UK's example was followed by many other Western countries, including France, Italy, and Germany. Eventually, there were 57 prospective founding members of the AIIB from five continents. And now we're all looking forward to the setting up of the AIIB because we think AIIB can play a very major role in providing the financing that is needed. On January 16, 2016, after more than 800 days of preparatory work, the AIIB was officially founded in Beijing. It was the first multilateral financial institution in the world to be established as a result of a Chinese initiative. President Xi Jinping addressed the founding ceremony. He stressed that the initiative to establish the AIIB was a constructive move. He said it would enable China to fulfill its greater international obligations, help improve the current international economic system, and provide more international public goods. He also said that the move would bring common benefits and achieve win-win outcomes for all sides. Chinese banker Jin Li Chun was elected the first president of the AIIB.已经开始对亚洲地区的国家进行投资今年就是银行开业六个月我们就有四个项目得到了批准这些项目呢将对亚洲成员国的经济产生积极的效应我们今年还会准备更多的项目同时由于我们的成员国不仅仅是亚洲
using all the experience from other uh, international financial institutions. So I think it's, it's a good thing. But we should not create, co I think, competing institutions. We should co cooperating and, and institutions that help uh, address the global issues. They are very important global issues, and we need to put our resources together to address them. The first four investment projects already approved by the AIIB's board are located in Bangladesh, Indonesia, Pakistan, and Tajikistan. The AIIB, despite its registered capital of 100 billion US dollars, is not merely a cash pool. Instead, it's a giant lever facilitating huge investment in construction. It makes it possible to build giant infrastructure projects requiring substantial capital, which otherwise might have to be abandoned. This could be not just a new infrastructure put in place, but this should be a new major breakthrough in terms of financial mechanisms, how money could be put in practice to do major change, major impact which will encompass millions of people and last for decades. For many years, due to issues with the global structure of financial governance and the resultant monopolistic control exercised over the global financial system, the developing economy's demands for funding could not be satisfied. As a new platform that is open and inclusive, the AIIB enables emerging markets and developing economies to have a say in global financial issues. Eventually, with its prompting, a new international monetary and financial system will be established that is fair, just, inclusive, and orderly. Today, uh, the governance mechanisms around the World Bank and the IMF have still not convincingly address the issue of emerging market participation. Uh, the AIIB, therefore, is a very good step in that regard. By creating an institution with a governance structure which has significant emerging market voice and participation, uh, it should allow a better balanced approach to the overall uh, global financial architecture. As an intergovernmental multilateral investment institution, the AIIB's main focus is supporting infrastructure projects that promise to promote connectivity and economic integration in Asia. In this, it complements the Belt and Road Initiative's aim of achieving all-round development. By addressing the pressing issue of funding shortages and giving a boost to infrastructure construction, the AIIB holds out the promise of a better future for Asia. Et le petit garçon aujourd'hui qui est à l'école à Shanghai ou à Chengdu ou à Shenzhen et qui a 12 ans, il peut se dire que la route de la soie, elle est faite pour lui. Parce que quand il aura 30 ans, il y aura là une infrastructure de développement économique et culturel qui lui appartiendra. Et je pense que aujourd'hui, il faut penser aux enfants qui seront les citoyens de demain avec des grands projets. Et c'est pour ça que cette cause-là, il faut qu'elle soit internationale. From the Silk Road Fund to the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the world has witnessed solid steps being taken towards a promising future of connectivity, inspired by the Belt and Road Initiative.